time period, one of the things Silberman did is he actually raised the standard. They're having a big enrollment problem. Okay, so this is a high fixed cost business, okay, where you need students to come in. And they're actually raising standards in this type of environment, you know, to, uh, to, to get them. The other thing is trading for like four times cash flow, you know, free cash flow. Uh, so it's, it's really, you know, valuation. And this is at this price. Now I started buying at 120, you know, and then 70s, 70s are basis. Now it's at 40, you know. Now it's, in my opinion, it's kind of a fat pitch, you know. Uh, you have a strong balance sheet. You've got a lot of growth opportunity. You have a CEO that is just not budging on what's important to a for-profit uh, company, you know, which is the student, and making sure that the academic outcomes are really good. Um, you know, a lot of the reasons the stocks are all down is because the industry went after, and they should have, you know, is a very bad industry. Um, so for example, uh, every uh, University of Phoenix, uh, Corinthian, they all used to have uh, academic advisors that got paid a commission on the number of students they brought in. So even Washington Post, Kaplan, you know, which is now Kaplan, I mean, really, it's like, which surprised me, they were getting bums off the street to go to school. Um, and that, I mean, that's publicly available. I mean, I think 60 Minutes did an expose on that. So Strayer actually never has paid uh, commissions to their academic advisors. You know, in fact, if you call and you pretend to be a student, which we do all the time, they'll never call you back, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, they don't force you. But you call uh, University of Phoenix, don't do it because you'll never get off their list. And they're like, are you ready to enroll? Are you ready? You know, it's like, no, I'm not ready to enroll. <laughs> So that's, that's, so valuation, management, and, and it's a compound machine. It's a business that has a lot of growth prospects. So that's kind of, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just uh, following up on that, with, uh, with Silverman retiring, I mean, is that an issue? And, and also, earlier in your talk, you talked of, you, you, you spoke of, um, you know, all the, all the Ivy League people had it wrong when yeah. you talked about these universities. Yeah. So, so, I mean, who is their customer? Uh, so starting on the, on, Silverman's not retiring. What happened is he became executive chairman. Right, right. And he wanted to do this for about two, he used to work for Warren Buffett. Um, so he used to actually work at Berkshire. Uh, and he has learned that to be a good capital allocator, you have to be removed from the day-to-day -day operations. So this has been a plan of his, to remove himself from the day-to-day -day operations. So McDonnell, who's now CEO, uh, was COO. Really, he ran the company for the last seven years because if you look even at the conference call, and there's a questions about faculty or, uh, or anything like that, he defers to McDonnell. So he, the reason he moved is he felt like, one, you know, he wanted to give McDonnell the reign to run the company, but he's, a, he's in a good position to be a better capital allocator and also enforce the standards, make sure McDonnell does it. It's very tempting to lower your standards right now to get enrollment growth. And all the other schools are doing it, but they're, you know, it's, when you've got a, somebody like Silverman in that role saying no, um, now, on what they get wrong, the average student of Strayer is, um, and this is for Strayer and it changes for each university, uh, but the average student uh, makes about twenty dollars to $25,000 a year you know, before they go in. Their average age is about 35. They're a working adult. Working adult, working being the, the primary, you know, that's why Strayer is having problems is that you know, that customer base of working has been having problems. If you look at shadow unemployment, it's, it's quite high. It's jumped up a lot. Um, but uh, it's a working adult. And when they leave Strayer, it takes six years to get your degree, you know, on average. It's, it's actually a huge commitment. You know, people really underestimate that. But Strayer's focus, and the whole for-profit industry, the, the reason it came about was traditional universities don't know how to service a working, uh, you know, uh, and, and most of it, when it's 70 percent is female, so it's usually working mothers, you know, that are, have a job. They, they're a mother, and they're going to school. And basically, by investing, uh, the average student gets about 22000 in debt, they're able to double their salary. So this is, this is the track record of Strayer. Um, the, all the other schools have different records, but for Strayer, it's, it's usually a working adult uh, that needs knowledge. They don't want to be in, in a class with you guys. You know, you're younger. You know, they want to be in there with people that are like them, and they want the school to know how to service them. You know? So for example, in the for-profit, their admissions process and uh, getting financial aid is, is super efficient, you know, if you compare it to a traditional university. I mean, it's very easy. Um, they make it easy, you know, so they're very customer focused from that standpoint, something traditional universities really fail at. Does that answer your question or? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Why? Well, I think if you pick any of them, you're fine. Um, uh, for us, our primary criteria is management. 
And I don't think the other companies have it. I mean, I, I, I used to say, when I, after meeting a lot of the CEOs at the other companies, I felt like taking a shower. They're very sleazy, you know, <laughs> um, with, because they're all about stu getting students. They look at students as like factors of production. You know, get them in, get them in, get them out. You know, they don't care. Uh, like some of these online-only schools, I mean, the graduation rate's like 2%. So it's, it's a numbers game of getting the most enrollment and most enrollment. You know, they can care less about if they're doing, you know, you're like, wow, you're saddling your students with debt, and then you don't care, you know? You just, you just want to make profits. Bridgepoint is one. But at the current valuations, I don't think you really go wrong with any of them, you know? I mean, none of them are going under, you know? Every, and their margins, all of them are great. Strayer's margin under the worst case scenario is 20%, their operating margin. I mean, it's insane. The return on capital dropped to 35%. I mean, that's a great business. In the, in, that's distressed, you know? That's, that's, that's what's going against them. So then a follow-up to that. <laughs> Well, it's hard. yeah, that always worries me because New Mountain is a private equity firm. A lot of their board members, actually, that's how Silberman got there in 2001. Was this company N New Mountain brought them in? And there's a, uh, but it's very hard to take uh, them private, especially now, because uh, they're other provisional. All of them, the, the Department of Education doesn't don't care. They they went after all of them, and they put them on something called a provisional certificate. So that if you have a change in control. That is a really bad thing for the Department of Education. And, and, and that's why Silverman actually postponed his plans to become executive chairman. Uh, he w wanted to do it two years before, but you know, it, with all this stuff, he said, this is not a good time. So I, I, it could happen. You know, I, it's a, again, thinking in a range. It could, and I would, I, that would disappoint me. You know, if I woke up and said, even though it's at, I, I have it at 40 and they sold it at 100, that would really disappoint me. It would be a bad day for me. But it's hard to do. It's hard to take them private. It's hard to take them public. I mean, it's really a hard business to get into. Yeah. Oh, back there, I guess. On another topic, what's your uh, general take on acquisition investments? You know, we have uh, Kodak mentioned, hired Ron Johnson, uh, yeah. so Herbalife situation. I think uh, we saw Lexon just took a trade from that. Uh, across the board, I mean, obviously those are some high profile recent announcements, but uh, yeah. just across the board, you know, is it a good thing, bad thing? It's a niche, you know. I mean, it's a great way to raise money. Um, you're out there, you know. <laughs> um, I knew Ackman, you know, when he first failed, and yeah, I don't know him now, and I won't see him on the second failure. But you know, Ackman's a good example. A lot of envy. You know, you read the stories of you know him riding a bicycle and trying to, you know, outpace Dan Loeb. I mean, there's a Vanity Fair article about these hedge fund guys. Uh, but activism on its own. It's hard to change, you know. That's one. I mean, for me, it doesn't work. I mean, it's it, you got to be a certain character type, you know, to do that. And um, so it's not really. I, I really can't comment because it's not something I know a lot about. But it, it does take a specific type of character to be able to do that. I don't think it's you know bad or good. I really just. I, I should just say I, don't, I really don't know. I don't know the answer to that. You know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because I, well. That's a good question, you know, because if you see an activist going in there changing, there's no doubt Ron Johnson had a lot of pressure from Ackman to go out and make some announcements of how he's going to change this business. Um, and so I think you're right in thinking that way, that if you see them in there or an icon, they tend to be more short-term oriented because they want a short-term catalyst. And so when, you know, if they start talking about culture and building employees, you know, the activist is like, whatever, you know, let's just cut the cut half the workforce, okay? Now, <laughs> you know, let's get the margin up. So, it, you know, from that standpoint, but yeah, it, it definitely could be a big negative from that. Yeah. No, I mean, um, I, I don't know what I, I don't know that story specifically to tell you the truth. But um, you mean if if I see a change in chairman, would that bother me uh, in a company? Yeah, I mean, because uh, in in some ways they. They do set, help set vision. They support, you know, the CEO. But like I said, you know, first thing we did today was we made him chairman, you know, and he was. He, I learned. I'm, I'm just telling from the inside. It's they really don't have the influence you think they do. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's something definitely we pay attention to from the standpoint: is the culture of the business going to change? Is the chairman going to? Especially if the chairman owns a lot of stock. You know, if it's just kind of a role, you know, it's it's not. Uh, yeah, I guess I I haven't run into that situation that often. Yeah, so sorry, Anna. Oh, there's so one more question about uh -huh. Strayer. Yeah. But um, in your letter yeah. to investors, you said yeah. that uh, the macro economy was something that was causing yeah. a lot of problems for Strayer yeah. right now. Yeah. And then also when you were talking, you said that it's become, you were thinking of a yeah. short term, it's 
become more of a long-term investment for you. So do you see the macro conditions improving to get yeah. Australia back to previous earnings? Uh, or is there a certain time frame you have on that investment now? So again, on the not predicting, you know, so what we do is we, we with Strayer specifically, we look at shadow unemployment, you know, which you just put shadow in Google. And if you notice it, um, you know, the, the chart, it, it, it shows enrollment growth. Uh, and it's kind of trending down a little bit. And we also look at a lot of their, a lot of their students come from community colleges, like 30%. So we look at community college enrollments within their specific markets, you know, like in Austin, ACC is a feeder. And you can see the business degree, which 70% of what they do is a business degree. So when we're following all that, you know, and we're doing it for all the universities, it's just kind of a stabilization. I don't see big drops yet, but I mean, We'll see how good that is as a predictor, but you know things are stabilizing, so it's it's going to be a little bit further out. But the thing about Strayer, it's a high fixed cost business, so when they lost 20% of their students for three quarters, they went from earning $10 to five. Now, when that turns, now that they've caught the cost structure, they're not growing anymore. When that turns, it's going to be just as you know, it 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 doesn't take a lot of students to start really you know hitting the bottom line like it did in the past. Uh, at this price, I think there's a pretty large margin of error. Of course, I said that when it was at 72. Um, so, yes. Uh, what has been your favorite investment that you've made and why? I think Whole Foods, because I learned a lot. I used to not like uh, John Mackey, their CEO. I thought he was a hippie and crazy <laughs> and, you know, just like love. And like he would tell me, Michael, you know, you can't get... Uh, you don't get happiness by pursuing it directly. You get it by love, and you know. And I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> uh, whatever, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> keep smoking out, you know. <laughs> but he's right, you know. It's like you can't pursue success directly. You got to get it from other factors, you know. Like, and that's his whole mantra is about, uh, you, you, you know, he's against this whole shareholder value is the sole purpose of a corporation. And he's right, you know, shareholder value is built by treating your customers well, treating your employees well. You know, it's, it's, if you go after shareholder value directly, uh, you're not gonna do so well. So it's a good investment as I learned a different way of thinking. You know, 99 was my biggest mistake, uh, but that's when I realized I was of, the, of a different mentality of Dave Gold doesn't know what he's doing. Let's get rid of this old guy and, and bring in the fresh blood. I remember going to Dave, a good story is, we were going to do candy aisles at the checkout, and I brought Dave a planogram, and I said, we're going to roll this out. And Dave said, well, go put that in the Compton store. Go put it in the, in the El Segundo store, and, and then there's a white uh, neighborhood in Arcadia. Try it with different demographics. Come back six months, you know, and I was just listening to Dave going, man, you don't know what you're doing, you know? And so we went out, you know, and, and, and later I learned he was right, you know, obviously. But, I, like, idea generation. Um, so, uh, you know, we look for compound machines. So we have a criteria, you know, so I call it, uh, I used to call it perfect spouse theory. You know, the better your spouse, you know, the easier it is to make criteria, you know, <laughs> like um, the less you're going to be trying to, to you, know, if you, so, you know, if you have a great husband, you know, that's great to you, you're not going to be looking around so much. So you've got to have a high criteria, but the criteria helps you select, you know. Because if you have a low spouse, you know, you're dating, I uh, hate using this term, but you're all students, a douchebag, you know, <laughs> then... <laughs> then everybody's going to look good to you. You know, like, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have, so it's all, about, um, it's all about criteria. So our criteria is management first. So uh, what we did is we actually went through all uh, 10,000 stocks, and we went and read all the proxies and looked for companies that, that kind of, they all, they all kind of look the same, smell the same, even though they're, one's an organic retailer and one's a for-profit school. Uh, so... Um, you know, they, there's a certain common theme that we look for them. We look for companies that aren't, we look at the culture, like we go to the careers tab of the website of the company, and we look to see if they talk about culture. Like if you're a potential employee, are they talking about culture? Um, so there's a certain criteria. We're using that criteria to filter through, and that's our core ideas. And then we have opportunistic ideas, which we get through new lows uh, lists, you know, talking to some people that we like, um, and, and, and that kind of stuff. So that's just the way we do it. Um, um, so I think I need rules because I do over allocate. It's my biggest problem. Um, I need rules to protect me. You know, 5%, uh, something has to be a 5% position. And off the bat, I just noticed the good money managers tend to do that. You know, they don't try to time it like I did Semex. You just 5%, 10% position, kind of max. If you really, you know, strayer at this price, uh, definitely 20% is fine with me, you know, because it's just like you, you don't need a lot to make that work. Um, or it depends on the company too. Like, uh, so yeah, we've done a lot on portfolio 
like, uh, like Brookfield Asset Management is a very diversified company that has contracted free cash flows going out 20 years. You, you pretty much know what their earnings are going to be at least in the next 5, 10 years. In a case like that, I think 20% positions at the right price you know, are definitely uh, worth it. But it also is tied to value. You know, if I've learned one thing from this guy in Zionsville, I mean, he buys companies for one to two times cash flow, and you think they don't exist, but he's, he's, he's always fine. I mean, he just bought Best Buy at 12 bucks a share at five times, uh, you know, uh, earnings, you know, and it's like you get these, if you just wait, you know, his secret is he, and he's got 50, so he's up 60% this year, and he's got 50% cash. Is well, it, yeah, no, I mean, the CEO says Obama's the best friend I have. You know, gun store owners say that, you know. <laughs> You know, you go to a gun store owner and you say, are you Republican? They're like, hell no, you know. <laughs> and they talk, you know, they're Republican inside, but they love Obama. And, and it is. It's because Obama had the gun laws. They've, they've, it's total tailwind. You know, you've got all these, I got, you know, I'm here in Texas. <laughs> you know, you've got a lot of people wanting to buy guns before. And so it's been a perception thing. So it's a lot of tailwind. Whenever you have that, it, it definitely should not be a big position, you know, it, because it definitely, I think it's, run, there's not much management can do to get it, you know, further than that, and there's been a lot of tailwind. Uh, so I think it's a dangerous stock to, to have a lot in, you know, and to own. Does that kind of answer your question? Or? Okay. Uh, yes. Being your emphasis on evaluating management uh, with companies, take, for example, Brookfield, the joke yeah. joke in it. If Bruce Flat were to walk out the door tomorrow, yeah. would you reevaluate the position being that, you know, he, you know, yeah. look at the company. You said that he got cash yeah. flows contracted out several years, but yeah. would you still reevaluate the company because his leadership is gone? Yeah, I would. I'd sell a lot. I'd start selling. It's like Berkshire. I mean, right. yeah, they say, small. you know, well, it's going to last. You look at all these conglomerates. You look at, after the CEO leaves things, well, like in the case of like Whole Foods, you know, if John Mackey got kicked out, the stock would go up. You know? But Mackey is the, is the sheriff in town. So, for example, Mackey, I once asked him, what, what do you think will happen to Whole Foods when he leaves? said, so first thing, they, Whole Foods has a salary cap. So they, the executives can't make more than 30 times what the lowest paid employee can make. He so says, first thing to go would be that. <laughs> you know, so, and there's an ingenious to having the salary cap because what it does is it brings in people that are there for passion. You know, they're not there for the money. Um, so it's, it, but once you, you lose kind of the special sauce, like with Steve Jobs leaving. I mean, you're already seeing it. I mean, the signs are there that Apple is not going to be what it used to be because the smart talent leaves first. One thing I learned at 99 was, you know, when we started implementing changes, uh, the, the smart people left, you know, quick. You know, it's, they leave quick. Then how do you execute? And that's the other thing I learned. In, very, in, in companies, very few people develop a lot of value. You know, you need, Bruce, in Bruce Flatt's case, you know, there's probably five people there that really create most of the value with Bruce being 80% of it in his decision making because without him there they lose the discipline of making good investments because he keeps it you know he's not involved in the day-to-day -day, you know of an investment and he sees kind of the big picture uh, but it, it, had he not been there a lot of people would like say four out of five people go against him all the time and he's always the last one going you know what we'll get it next time and they're like yeah but we spent a year evaluating this he's like I know that we'll get it next time you know and he's usually right you know so you need that so I would sell uh, or, I'd, or I'd start have to, having to find something else. Yeah. Yes, sir. How do you know when to sell? That's a really good question. You know, one thing is, is letting things ride. Like my, my noble competitor, Brad Leonard, uh, because of his cheap valuation emphasis, also has a, a sell discipline of selling cheap, you know. Um, you know, it depends on the company. Like an Astrayer, say it gets to 180 a share. Um, the, it, it depends on the company is what I'm saying, the sell decision. You look at the future growth opportunities, or a, a Storm Ruger. You know, like, you know, how much more can earnings uh, go from there? So one thing we like to do is like, um, and I find good CEOs do this, or good managers or founders, they like to think of the of the future and then work back. Like, okay, I want to be. I was just listening to uh, a guy uh, that uh, grew uh, Keller Williams, which is the largest now real estate brokerage firm, and his thing was that he would say, I want to be the largest uh, real estate brokerage firm. Well, how do you get there? You, well, I need the most agents. Well, how do I get the most agents? So same thing goes in investment, you know, when you're thinking of when to sell, like with Strayer, do, can they continue to grow, you know, um, it, it, say Apollo doubles? Well, that's a little tougher because they, they're pretty mature. They have campuses everywhere. Stray, Strayer's only halfway through its nationwide campus expansion plan, so they're the sell decision. I think it's best to wait. Whole Foods, same thing. Whole Foods has run up a lot. You know, it's got a 4.5% free cash flow yield, but there's a lot of leverage in their system from growth. You know, they've got a lot of growth there. 
so we kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Brookfield Asset Management is one that you do best not to sell, you know, because that's one that has compounding characteristics. They can move money from different asset classes, from real estate, infrastructure. So there it's like, if it was just a real estate firm, you know, that only invested in office space, like one of their entities, you know, I'd think of starting to sell that just because they've already gotten most of the class A space at a cheap price. So it's, it's, it, it's investment by investment, depending on the growth characteristics, you know, or if management changes or stuff like that. So management changing is, is usually like quick, you know, like Mackie's gone, I'm out, you know, is it's gonna, it's gonna fall, you know. Um, and I'll sell too early in that case, but I, I think, you know, it, it, it's better to do that. So okay, I, uh, no more questions? I guess I'll, I'll uh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> so you talked about AIG and like yeah. trying to figure out exactly how they make money, yeah. and that's why you don't really invest in it. Yeah. Can you answer that question? Is there like a specific industry that you kind of stay away from because yeah. it's not fully understandable? That's one. That and banking, you know. Uh, yeah, it's just I don't know how to evaluate insurance. It took me a while to realize that, you know, because I was trying, basically an investment manager I admire was buying AIG and, and I said, gosh, you know, he's never really wrong. Uh, I better look at it too. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I de it's definitely with the circle of, of competence, just I don't enjoy it. You know, like I don't, I understand banking, but um, I, I'm just not comfortable. I, I don't see every loan, so I'm not comfortable. Or insurance, like I remember talking to Joe Brandon who ran Jin Re for Buffett and he says, you know, one year's bad underwriting and I destroyed this company. One year, and I was like, I don't like any business where one year, same as in banking, we have a banker here, one year of bad loans, you're done, you're toast, you know? So I don't like that kind of business, you know, because I'm concentrated and I over allocate, so, you know, I can't, I can't add that, you know, that's like adding gasoline to fire for me. Um, but that's why I stay out of it, honestly. It's just, I enjoy retail, you know, I like retail, I get it, I like the, the people in it, um, so. Um, anything you enjoy learning more about, I think that's the biggest mistake analysts make is they, they analyze companies they don't enjoy. And analyst firms, you know, like a lot of my friends that are now bosses, you know, I'm like, why are you assigning this, this company to your, this analyst? He, he could care less about that. You know, he's not going to gain any great insight. You know, he's, he's, when he's done at five, he's done at five, you know, versus, you know, studying companies you enjoy learning about. Like if you don't enjoy learning about AIG, just don't do it, you know. There's a lot of opportunities out there. So, hope that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Or, oh, okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, are there any investors that influenced your decision or how you made the checklist, or was it just from past experience? I think what ha the, the reason the checklist came about is I got tired of, um, it, it started off differently. I started using it to increase my knowledge of a business. So, when I first started, uh, whenever a company would have an earnings release, um, I, so I, I, you know, I, and it was negative. I wouldn't know what to do. I was like Chicken Little, you know, running around going, sky's falling here. You know, it really felt that way. You know, like, oh, stock's down, you know, Strayer's down 50%. You know, oh, you know, what, what am I going to do? And so I said, gosh, the problem is I don't understand a lot about the business. So that's how it first started, was it gave me knowledge. And then I started producing these reports that were this thick, answering all the questions, and then going, where's that coming? Where's that leading to? You know, um, so then it evolved into, well, this is a tool to value a business, you know, because so it, it kind of stumbled into it um, more than anything. It wasn't like something I planned to do. It just kind of got got became that, you know. So, okay. You know, no, that's the thing about passion. No. No, that, like uh, my dad died a year and three months ago and he had an oil company and I had to take over some of his operations. And my, that's when I woke up hating life, you know, <laughs> because I was like, I don't know how to make decisions. I don't like this industry. I don't, every, my day was long, you know, like now in hindsight, like some of the stuff that really got to me is like ridiculous. You know, it was like, oh, you know, this is, I had to fill out this form for the state of New Mexico. You know, it's one page, it had 10 line items, and it was, took me all day, you know? And it, so, yeah, I mean, there, in that case, I was forced into a business not wanting to be in it, and, and in that case, that's a sign that you're not passionate. But there is not a day that I don't enjoy learning more about business, you know, learning, meeting a business person, even when I'm having a bad day, you know, fighting with the wife and all that, it's still kind of like, ah, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, like, it, 
And that, that's the thing is that you'll know it when, when you get it, whatever it is. You know, it doesn't have to be investing. Uh, so, or. Um, when you listen to Munger or Buffett, they tend to be very little things like macro, like what's happening in the macro yeah. economy. And you talk about individual businesses, but do you listen to anything like interest rates or what's going to happen with QE and anything like that, unemployment? Does that affect your decisions? Or? Uh, no, uh, but you know, it's, it's good to know what kind of environment you're in. I don't think, it, it, like today, you know, which you're, it's not so much. I think whenever you get into forecasting, you'll always be wrong. Um, you know, it just, it just, it's just when you start thinking, I think interest rates will hit. But it's good to start thinking like, like with Brookfield, uh, they're interest rate sensitive. You know, so the question becomes, at what, point, what, at what point do interest rates really hurt you? So they're saying, well, if long rates go to 5 or 6%, we'll be fine. Um, but it's more understanding like what impact different economic environments will have, you know, because the moment you start trying to predict and trying to think you have some visibility into that, it's just the opposite happens. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I just kind of got it. I mean, I, 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 let's say, uh, you know, out of 100, I'm probably at 30, you know, and that's all I'll ever get, you know, like as far as how good I, you know, and, and his, he was a kind of in the particular niche, you know, where it's a lot of, it's not super management intensive. Uh, first thing I did is I got rid of the bad people. He actually had some bad people around him um, to simplify my life. So I mean, I just kind of more blocking and tackling. But I did borrow from some of the things in investing. Uh, so you know, I hired a better accountant. You know, somebody. Uh, uh, you know, I was uh, more careful on the type of people. I, and I sought advice from people that are in it day to day. You know, should I participate in this drilling deal? Well, they're the ones that know that. You know. Uh, and by, I would never be able to answer that question. So, I mean, that's kind of how I've had to manage it. But the point is that I really didn't enjoy life. I mean, it's just when you do, not enjoying what you do, it, life is hard. You know, it really is. It's not fun. You know, I mean, it just, it, it, your days are longer. The problems are bigger than they really are. Uh, you don't know how to make decisions. It's a very frustrating environment to be in. You know, so I, I mean, I just got a recent dose of it. You know, I didn't realize how life hard could be, <laughs> you know. No, well, it wasn't something you could really sell. I just was holding on. You know, some things, yes, you know, but, um, you know, I think it's like uh, in, in anything that I could, yeah, th that was a big time commitment, I had to. You know, I said, I'm not the person. I'm sure I'm selling it in, at, a, at a cheap price, but it's something I'll never be good at. I, yeah, so there were some entities that I did have to get rid of, but, yeah, I don't know if that. Yes, sir. Oh. I'd say you, you, you're smart, but not too smart. Uh, and, uh, and the people on Wall Street are smart and think they're smart. And there's something about being humble. You know, when you come out from like a Harvard or a Stanford, and my brother-in-law killed me from this, sister-in-law came, it's just, you know, they're not, um, you know, you're here, grades, you're, you're not, there's no grade inflation here. You know, you can flunk out of here, you know. Um, so the advantage is I think that you do have a more humble uh, take on stuff than if I, you know, my friends from Princeton, and not, not to say all of them, are, I don't like making a, a one judgment, but I'd say overall, you know, they come out thinking, hey, you're superior, you went to Harvard, you know. <laughs> you kind of have that mentality, you know, so you, you adopt a very uh, a negative menta mentality than if you come from Texas Lutheran, and, you know, it's not, and you're trying to get, a, say, Wall Street, you know, they'll just look at it and go, oh, no, it's one of those Baptists again, you know, from, from Texas, you know, and they'll just, oh, no, no, I don't want these guys, you know. Um, so you have more to overcome, you know. Uh, so it's 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 more, and that's how they look at it. Like that's how they look at Southwestern. Oh, some small school, and you know. But you you have to work harder at it. So I think it's a benefit, you know, because I think if you're given a lot of success early in life, and that's going to, success early in life could be going to an Ivy League. I think that's a negative, you know, because then you kind of. I mean, it's got its positives. Don't get me wrong. The networks are amazing. Um, that's the downside is that the networks are, you know, you go to Harvard, you know, and it's like you can call, you know, uh, thousands of grads and, and get into an industry, you know, and they're going to meet with you. But, um, but I think the benefit, I'd rather, I'd rather work harder at it than just kind of have it, you know, I, I, it's better to have that headwind, in my opinion, uh, early on. Um, and it is a headwind. I mean, it, it depends where you're trying to get, you know. I mean, if, if you're trying to get a job with somebody that went to this school, it's no problem. But if you're trying to go somewhere else, it's a problem. You know, um, yes, sir. What was the draw to Wall Street when you first got out? The envy, pro well, no, the draw to what you mean, like why I wanted to go there? Oh, that's where the value investors were initially. You know, 
Uh, then uh, it became this envy thing, you know, where, I, you know, it's just I started networking with more people there, and then I got, you know, it's like all of a sudden I wanted a house in the Hamptons, and I'd never been there, you know. It was like, <laughs> you know, I was like, I think I need to get a house at the Hamptons. At some point in my life, I will have a house in the Hamptons, you know, and it's like when I got there, I was like, I oh, know, Cancun's Beach is way better. That's a two-hour flight, you know. <laughs> so... <laughs> But it was that, you know. Wall Street, I, I, you know, it's like Buffett says, he points the other way. There's a reason for it. Wall Street's filled with envy. I mean, I didn't know what a frenemy was, but I was surrounded by frenemies, you know, friends that are enemies, you know. It's like, on one end, hey, buddy, you know, and then, and then it's like, ah, oh, you know, Brandon is an idiot, you know, and it's like, <laughs> you know, and it's like, you, and, you're, and you're saying that to his investors, you know, like, how can you trust this guy, you know? But then it's like, oh, Brandon and I are having dinner. It, it, there's a lot of, it, 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 Wall Street, that's why, I think it's not a good environment because it does support that kind of culture. And, and it's hard to say, like some people are able not to get into that. You know, I just know I, I, you know, I did get into it, but uh, it's hard not to, you know, it's, it's hard not to fall into that, you know, because you do get competitive, you know, and it's just that it's, it's, you, it's setting you up. Um, now people are already there, it's a little different. I always said about New York, you know, I say it, the, the problem is New Yorkers are actually very nice people. It's these Texans and people from Tennessee and Kansas that moved to New York, you know, that are really the jerks. You know, you're like, you know, where are you from originally? You know, I was talking to one family office and he's like, how could you go to Southwestern and what a horrible place in Texas? And I looked at his bio and he went to UT Austin and I was like, you know, like, interesting. Are you from Texas? You know, yeah, yeah, I'm from Austin. You know, I was like, okay. <laughs> so any... Money flow stuff? Honestly, never. Not, n but I, I don't know if it's bad or good because I don't know anything about that. So, um, yeah, I just, uh, I know some, yeah, I just don't know anything about that. I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, yes? Uh, have you ever been deceived or sort of burned by management with, with such a focus on them? Um, you know, have, yeah. have you thought that they were good and it sort of turned out they weren't so good? Or has your background research been just so in depth? Yeah, I mean, deceived from the standpoint of I had an expectation that wasn't, they never were what I thought they were, but that was my problem. Yeah, right. You know, so a lot of times, you know, yeah, I would answer that question, yeah, you know, I thought John Mackey was this, but that was my perception of John Mackey. He was never that, you know, and it had to do where I was in life, what I admired, the people I was around. Uh, you know, once I got away from my frenemy crowd, you know, I started being able to see people better. I'd say one thing that's helped me a lot is now I'm, I'm, I've got a pretty high bar now for people. And what I've noticed is that when I mix people, like I used to know a lot of hedge fund managers, some that we've, you know, big names, and they're not the best care. They're not, you, you really, if you really saw their lives, you wouldn't want to trade places with them. You, know, you really wouldn't. Um, but I mixed it. And whenever I mix, I make mistakes with people. But now that I'm just focused on founders and like the Bruce Flats, the no attitude, when somebody shows me a little attitude, I just, you know, I, I, I have that as, going back to perfect spouse, you know, I have that criteria. Uh, where, but, but if you mix people, you know, if you hang around vandals and, 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 and then really good people, your judgment gets flawed, you know. It, so, but if you stick with a certain niche of people, I feel like your judgment gets better, you know. So I'd say that, that's been the learning process, you know. And then what's good, right? Is that when I was young, what I thought was good is not what I think is good today. Right. So you sort yeah. of found that the, those personalities yeah. like Bruce Flats, Warren Buffett, those people that tend to uh, not really care about the lavish lifestyle, they're more focused on just yeah. running their business, running it. You know, they're kind of the people you, you want to go towards instead of the people telling yeah. you how good they are. Yeah, I mean, that, when somebody has to tell you, it's an insecurity. You know, I studied narcissism a lot. A lot of CEOs are, but it's an insecurity, you know. Um, so they're very insecure individuals. So when you see a lot of these hedge fund men, that's why I say you wouldn't want to trade places if you really saw it. I've been on a corporate jet or a jet of one of these hedge fund managers, and they put uh, tomatoes in a sandwich. And about, you know, we were going from uh, Greenwich to L.A., and he just went nuts for half the trip. And I'm just sitting there, you should see how I got to Greenwich, you know, like on, you know, on the, like packed like a sardine. I was like, 
we're in a G6, you know, like, <laughs> you know, if you don't like the tomatoes, take them off, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, they get so insecure and intense that you just kind of, you know, it's a hard way to live, you know. But it, the, better, the better the people you hang around, the better off you'll be. There's a question back there. Do you like the extra dodgers? Well, I, I don't invest. I haven't invested in it. I've been an admirer, in all honesty. Um, you know, it, it just following them for a long period of time. But I'd say, you know, they're very much focused on execution and putting their heads down and, and focusing on what's important, you know. So, for example, they're a very, I like that they're a decentralized business, that they leave the decision-making authority to each of their divisions. Um, I'm not huge into, like, giving financial incentives to people, but, I mean, the way they run it, you know, they get a percent, the way they make money is they get a percentage of operating profit, and each division gets a percentage of operating profit. So, it's like kind of, I don't know if you all remember Luby's Cafeteria, used to be a, a fantastic cafeteria when the managers were actually owners, you know, they actually uh, uh, were, were the owners of, 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 of the Lubies, and so they had every incentive, they, they were kind of under the expediter's model where this is my restaurant and they could make up to $300,000 a year, and this was in the 80s, you know, being a manager of a Lubies. And then when it transitioned to a new manager, they looked at the cost structure and said, oh, I can cut costs here really, really fast, and then Lubies kind of went down from there. Uh, so expediters, that's what I like about their model is, uh, you know, I've been an admirer. I've never purchased. I always thought it was too expensive, but I've been wrong. You know, it keeps going up and up. The, yeah, it's like 100000 or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's a great. And there's something about low salaries, and Dave Gold's was 100000 and Mackey's is a dollar. And, um, you know, it just says something about the person because, like money, like my biggest lesson in money has been money is really like um, financial freedom. You know, like at the end of the day, that's what money is. It gives you freedom. Like uh, if you have to get a job, you don't have any money, you got to take the job, you know. But if you have some money, you have financial freedom. When you view it as a, a tool to buy things, I can tell you, because I went through, a, I was a right place, right time person at a young age, and I got, hum, I got taken out. But during that time that I thought I was really smart, you know, I started buying certain things that I'm too embarrassed to say I did. But they lose their uh, they lose their their appeal like by day two you know it's like you know it's like I was at a, a client's uh, place and he had helicopters and jets and once you go in the helicopter two times it's like ah you know like <laughs> you know it's like I, it's not that big a deal you know so money is more of a you know financial freedom thing than than an object you know uh, it's hard to get there though. <laughs> Yeah, I use it to, to to look for disconfirming information initially. You know, as I'm, uh, and the questions vary, right? I mean, you don't, I don't answer every single question for every single company, um, because certain things are more impor important to a retailer than they are to, you know, another, insurance. yeah, insurance. Um, but um, so we look at, we use it to to look for disconfirming information, like why should we not be invested in this? So we can, because there's so many things to look at. It's like, okay, let's let's find a reason to kill this thing and, and, and move on, um, uh, and. I do it, uh, you know, to understand really the stability of earnings. My whole question is, you know, does this help me understand what the earnings are going to be like of this business? Like, what kind of pattern? Is this a wide distribution of cash flow company or is this a narrow distribution? Uh, you know, so I start thinking if you change management tomorrow in retail, it's got a more profound effect than somewhere else. Um, so that's kind of, does that kind of, that's, that's the way we use it. But yeah, we don't go through every question. There was an uh, unfortunate student that actually went through every question and came to me and was like, it took me eight months to do this. Do you really do it for every company? I was like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I, really, I should have put a paragraph in there. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I felt bad, you know, I was like. <laughs> yes, sir. About what? Oh. Creating builders or? Oh, filters, yeah. 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 Yeah, so I mean, okay, so say you gave me an idea I've never heard of, you know? Um, you know, just you give me a stock I've never heard of. It's some company based here and they went public, you know, three months ago and I've just never heard of them. 
First thing I would do is I would go read the, the, about the management. You know, how long has the management been there? And so that's my filter, you know, is, is I go to see what kind of person am I partnering with? What's their bio? You know, the product or sales focus? Is it, you know, uh, have they been at the business for a long period of time? Are they, the, you know, preferably they're the founder? So I would go quickly to understand the management as the first filter. Um, you know, another filter, like I said, is the career website. You know, if they take the time to talk about their culture, it's a great company, you know, where they're really talking about this is what it's like to work here. Uh, we like to look at glassdoor.com a lot. You know, that's a completely underutilized service where employees are, are describing what kind of company this is. You can learn all about the culture there. A lot of people think it's just ranting and raving. Well, that's how Yelp started. A lot of these, you know, sites start that way. But with Glassdoor, you know, it, it, it surprisingly, that, that company you're talking about may be either. And so those are the filters we look at to see if they fit. We look for companies that talk about values. Uh, because once you have, you know, values like this is the things we won't, you know, uh, mess around with. Um, so there's that, that filter to be able to pass quickly on, should I spend time, you know, not like that guy, that student that did eight months, you know, but can I, should I spend time on this business? And I, and I, I want to see if it fits my area, you know. That doesn't mean, you know, everybody's area. You, you will gravitate over time to whatever area. You know, I have a friend that loves asset investing. And I, I mean, I go to sleep hearing him, but he's so passionate about valuing tankers and stuff. And I'm just like, oh, enough. You know, I don't want to hear it. Um, so you, everybody's got their niche, and he's done a fantastic job. So that's, that's why I have my filter. He has his filter. You know, I talk about culture, and he's just like, please, shut up, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir, back there. Uh, number 58 in your list. Yeah. Tell me about uh, merger and acquisition. I don't have the list. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the mergers and uh, this is like a value. So if a company is merger oriented, you know, I run, I, I quickly do go to this question and I look to see, um, you know, how, uh, it, in other words, there is a pattern to a successful merger and acquisition. And one of them is that the uh, acquiring firm uh, doesn't really, uh, there's two types of acquirers. There's those that are just acquire you and then just change your culture tomorrow. And then the smart acquirers are the ones that are acquiring you for a talent, and they keep your employees. They communicate a lot. You know, so when they make an acquisition, they communicate a lot um, with the employees. So I'm looking for certain patterns you know, or criteria. But a checklist really, if you think about it, it enforces the application of every lesson learned. So I bought a lot of companies that were merger and acquisition oriented, but I didn't really it just brings things top of mind. You know? So there's a, you know, I, I will reread that section, and then I'll start looking at, for that pattern to see if it fits that, or you know, are they announcing changes? Are they firing, laying off people immediately? That kind of stuff. So, does that answer your question, or somewhat? <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, probably two hour, an hour at most, with something you know, sometimes two minutes. You know, just I can quickly see. Uh, like if I see Bob Nardelli running it, you know, bye, you know. Uh, so um, it's, uh, but it's just a, a question of experience and, 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 and lessons and screwing up a lot. You know, that's what, you know, initially everything takes a long time. You know, so when I used to, I, I laugh at these research reports I put together, but I think it was very important to learn about business and go through each of those uh, and take your time. But as time goes by, you start filtering things a lot quicker. It's like I was asking Bruce Flat, like how do you value hydroelectric dams so well? And they're in the hydroelectric business. Uh, basically, it's you know, a, a, a dam on the river system that produces electricity. And he goes, you know, after you make 200 acquisitions, you know, and, that, and, and he says, when your first acquisition is one where the person that you bought the, the dam from moved the river system, <laughs> you know, that's, that, that becomes your first question. You know, can they move the river system? Because literally, he said, he bought this dam, first acquisition of Brookfield and Hydro, and the person he bought it from went up the river and literally moved the river system. So, you know, over time, your, your mistakes, that's why I think mistakes are great. You know, you, you, you start kind of seeing, oh, this reminds me of the time that person moved the river system or, you know, whatever it is for me. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, your mistakes are a good thing, you know, so that's where they'll benefit you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, you know, it varies, and I had read, you know, was it Todd Combs that he just, um, one thing that we like is, um, 
we try to reach like con content rich stuff. So I do have, you know, outside of Anne, there's other people that put together packages for me. Like uh, say we're looking at Strayer. Uh, there's a Department of Education report uh, that outlines all the different, you know, uh, players in it. So that there's a packet of that. Um, but I'd say uh, that's what I spend all my time doing. Early on, I spent all my time talking to other investment managers, you know, which was not really the right. I mean, it's good, I think, in the beginning. You have to learn the way different people apply because that'll kind of give you a direction of where you fit or you self-select. You know, if you keep the envy out, you'll learn how to self-select fast. But, um, you know, the, the reading is, is, is just, I do it, yeah, that's most of the time at night and the day, you know, that kind of stuff. It's just, you get interested in, in, in things. Uh, but there's not a certain amount of hours. I will say that there's a, the, the, I have learned in the morning to block out the mornings. Um, and, if you, and the reason I learned this is I'm friends with some writers and, and actually some uh, musicians, some uh, and famous musicians. And the way they create is honestly, they, block, they do it in the morning, four hours straight. And that's about all they do. You know? And then the rest of the day, you can kind of spend doing other stuff. But if you're able to block out four hours in the morning, not look at email, not get distracted, you know, that's really all you need. You know, it really is. And then the rest, you can kind of get distracted. You talk to somebody else and all that stuff. But you, there is a declining curve on how much energy you're going to have. I don't care who you are. You know, there are people that say they don't sleep and all that. It does catch up. But, you know, the, the core stuff, I read in the morning. You know, so it's how I read. You know, I read the really important stuff in the morning. And then after that, I'll read other stuff. You know, so I make sure what I'm reading in the morning is high content, you know, this is not just some article about the company. This is actually the shareholder letters, or that kind of stuff. Does that help you? Or, oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, some. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you can tell, like you know. Um, yeah, I mean, the, that's too big of a risk for me sometimes. You know, with the good managers, there's some that just stand out, and they, you always find it like that. Uh, and then you've got the, the ones that have a long tenure. Those are the hardest, the ones that have been in the business a long time. They've been, you know, chief operating officer, and you really don't have a, a, a record. So I think before I would commit to a large investment, yeah, I mean, I, w I, I probably would make it a smaller position. Um, so I'm not saying I invest in everybody that I've seen. You know, I'd be lying to you. but. Um, Typically, yeah, I would do that. Where I learned that was actually uh, from, there's a, 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 a Chinese billionaire. I lived in Singapore. His name was Robert Kwok. And he told me, and he runs like the, he owns Coca-Cola and uh, out there. And he said that he always, he's the one that said that. He said, I always wait, you know, and I won't make a move. So I think it's better to, you know, there's a reason he's a billionaire and I'm not, you know. So let's follow his example. I think it's better just to wait. You take less risk, you know. So is it a risk I'm willing to take, you know, is, is the, the next question. But no, I haven't identified it in every investment I'd make. I, I, that wouldn't be true. No. Hope that helped. <laughs> we have one more question. Okay. Yeah. And uh, dual investment, you know, world acceptance, which is like a paid yeah. loan service company. And yeah. there's a lot of, there's a few big hedge funds who have come out and say that, you know, there's a bad ethic behind it. So yeah. what would be your view on that? Uh, you know, I mean, do you like going to a retailer and uh, they treat you like hell, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, no, and you're, you're not going to go there. Uh, eventually, you get caught out. So one of my examples is Jackson Hewitt. Jackson Hewitt had tax refund loans that were bad for customers. And um, they, they went for a long time with these tax refund loans, and all of a sudden, it caught up to them. You know, any business that doesn't do a good thing for its customers will fail. I mean, it just, it's a, it's, that's a law of business. You'd mistreat, if I mistreat you at Bucky's, you know, you're not going to come back to Bucky's, but right now they treat me pretty good, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, so it's, it's uh, yeah, to me, that's, that's a primary filter. You know, I would pass personally because. You know, it just you don't make a lot of long-term money. Maybe, but maybe it's an opportunity. Maybe you're an opportunistic investor, and your largest position is two percent. Maybe that makes sense for you. You know, but for me, it's when you have a five percent, ten percent position, or twenty, you know, thirty. What I have, I wouldn't do that. That's too. That's too big a risk. You know. Well, thanks, Dave. Yeah. Let's I'll give Michael it. a big round. Okay. Of applause. <laughs> 
Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.